Hello, it's... Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second episode of Eurovision Soup. Um, before we start, big thank you for the success on the pilot, and that's why we're doing this again. This is our one-stop show for anything a bit more Eurovision, a bit more deep analysis and what we can't talk about in our other shows. So, yes, yeah, so let us know what you want us to talk about first and foremost, and if you agree or disagree, make sure you let us know in the comments. Like, subscribe, and follow us on all our socials. You know the drill by now. And let's meet our panel straight away, and let's go to my right. We have Nicholas from Denmark. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, hope you're all doing well. And just one over from him, we have Stuart. How are you doing, Stuart? I'm good, thank you, Elliot. This is a first for me. I don't think I've ever felt I'm outnumbered by the Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you, well, now you know how I feel every time that I'm on Retrovision and they're saying just <laughs> no other than just British people. Fair enough. Yeah. And just remember, Stuart, just take Your it one step at a time. <laughs> Below him, we have Gustav. Evening, Gustav. Hey, guys. How are you doing? I'm alive, so let's take that as a positive. Oh. <laughs> I'm alive and well. <laughs> Too bad. And below me from Latvia, we have Lana. Hello, Lana. We haven't seen you in a while. How have you been? Oh, so nice to be here again. Missed doing shows with you guys. And we've missed you as well. It's always a pleasure to have you on. So let's crack straight on to the main topic of since we last filmed, which was last week, the Rotterdam Council has announced that they will give up the 6.7 million euros funding extra needed by Rotterdam to host Eurovision 2021. Now, this doesn't confirm that Rotterdam will be hosting in 2021. It just means the funds will be made available to them now. And just want to throw out that does it does this really seem that Rotterdam is now guaranteed to host? Uh, Nicholas, let's start with you. Mm, I think so. I think so. If they, because obviously, you has already said that that you know they are allowed to do it. They have the fundings for it. And now, of course, it is all about are they able to gather a team that can do this? Because obviously, you know, with everything going on at the moment, we will probably also see next year that a lot of TV productions that were going to be done this year might be moved to next year. So it could be that actually, you know, getting the whole team together could be could be difficult. There could be some changes out to the team, obviously, with, with the hosts and everything. Maybe some of the interval acts that they have planned, they won't be able to do. There's been a lot of talk as well about if they are going to do like the same theme and same logo and everything. I think there is a, a, a chance that it could be changing it because I think obviously the branding that they were going to use this year, they've used for a lot of a lot of like the Europe Shine a Light stuff and for the tribute album and everything. So I think that could be changing. But I mean, at this point, we don't know like what kind of Eurovision we're going to be getting next year, obviously, because we can't look that far ahead. No one knows what the situation is going to be. But I think I think that if there is going to be some sort of, of Eurovision, I think it's going to be somewhere in the Netherlands, at least. Hey, okay, Stuart, you, you know about money. You like, you'd like to bet enough. Um, <laughs> firstly, why, why do you think that Rotterdam needed this extra like six and a half million euros? That's not just little money and like they've had to wait a long time to get this granted. What makes you think that they needed this extra thing to do effectively the same show just a year later? Well, I suspect for a start, they'd be paying a hell of a lot more in insurance. Mm. Yeah, when you run an event of the, and you're thinking about uh, forward uh, these type of shows, uh, at the moment, the, the, uh, the organizers will expect much much higher insurance premiums so it's, it's a very very tough gig at the moment for any organizer any event planner to actually start thinking forward into this type of stuff um i also think it's very early to speculate on the location um i'm a little surprised that we're hearing that rotterdam are preparing to be the host next year um okay they won the uh, the bid this year but there, there's no guarantee that they should necessarily host next year um things changed you know there was a lot of reasons why uh, rotterdam won they amsterdam weren't prepared to host because they felt that the tourism would be too high it doesn't necessarily mean that's the same next year for amsterdam um but also remember that there were other locations in the netherlands that were keen to host and so i was a little surprised to hear that there isn't planning to be any bidding process but i wouldn't be at all surprised if that changes uh, um nevertheless the, the Netherlands have waited 45 years to win Eurovision and thoroughly deserve to host. Uh, and so I don't really care where it is as long as the Netherlands do get their opportunity. Because I think uh, from, a, from a Brit uh, that we won some 20 odd years ago, 
I can't imagine a scenario where we don't get to host the following year. That would be horrendous. And, uh, you know, I think to Sweden have hosted a number of times. You can imagine winning and not hosting. Latvia won in the last uh, 20 years too. Imagine not hosting the year after. Horrendous experience, and it must be horrendous for the Dutch. I feel for them and do hope they get to put on a really good, great show next year. OK, so Gustav, as Stuart says, Sweden have hosted numerous times, most recently 2016, where, and if you don't know this viewers, Gustav actually volunteered at Stockholm. He was there, you know, because that's his home city and he actually helped out. How important is it for the fans and people to be in that environment and see it all going on? Like from your first hand experience in 2016, how important was it to be involved with Eurovision? I think it's really important because um, it was two weeks of uh, of party it was two weeks of uh companionship it was two weeks where where the whole city was in this like big party mode everyone was happy everyone was like doing their thing uh, there were party there were not parties but there was stuff happening around the city and like everyone knew that eurovision is in town uh, and i think for people being in the host city or for people who comes to the host city that's a big part like uh, those two weeks or one week of just like having a good time okay and lana like stuart said there may be a bidding process now obviously rotterdam won it last year but because of what has been happening in the world and the loss of tourism do you think that you will see a lot more cities you know fight for the right to, rep to host next year if it is being said it'd be in the Netherlands. Even if Rostam get announced, do you think there'll be a kickback from other cities? I actually don't think there will be. I mean, there might, it's hard to predict, but at the same time, I think that as a country, they would understand that Rotterdam deserves the right to host. And from what we've seen this year so far, for example, the design of the stage and that, that that's spectacular. And I think that the next year they could show the same level of you know, beauty and the stage and everything. And I think that we will see Rotterdam hosting next year. But maybe that's just my opinion. <laughs> Joyce, I, it's hard for me not to see Rotterdam hosting, but at the same time, I can see why other cities would you know, step up their bit if they wanted to. Um, I think there's some things that need to be changed this year. Like, for example, I think the semi-finals need to be redrawn. I think, you know, just scrap them for this year, do it again. I think we need a new logo. The stage, yeah, they can use again because that has been signed off and no one actually saw it. And it wasn't being built. So it, it's effectively just in storage, it feels like. But I think, like, this, the the draw needs to be redone personally. I don't know if anyone agrees or disagrees with that, but I think if they don't reassign semi-finals, I'll be very surprised, to be honest. Mm. I, I think that's true. But I also, I think a, a big question occurs, and obviously none of us are really going to know that until we get, you know, into next year. But do we expect that just a year from now we can have like such a, a big arena contest that the Eurovision is? Because I think like, because we could look at say, oh, Rotterdam would definitely be the host. But do, do does any of you think that there would still be a possibility to have like kind of like a smaller TV studio or something as kind of like a plan B where they could be less people? Stuart, I saw you like for the face when Nicholas said that. You've got an opinion, haven't you? <laughs> well, it's a really interesting topic. And uh, yeah, I, I think you kind of have to almost look quite a bit forward at the moment. I think where we were just a month ago and think where we are today, um, it, you know, if we turn our attention to football, for example, soccer, as the Americans call it, um, we've just seen the, the Dutch abandon their season with no champion, no relegation. That's never happened before. You know, these are times where things are moving at pace. Um, we're likely to see uh, the same example of football extended in, in the UK and other countries until September, maybe October time when the seasons are supposed to start in uh, in July, August. So that, that's that's quite some distance. And so you then start thinking about other type of events, large music festivals where you have five, 10,000 people in attendance. And if you think back to the 6.7 million euros that, that the, uh, the the Dutch government have asked for, it's, it's part insurance, but it's also part the cost that they've lost through the postponement. Um, there's a huge amount of, of unforeseen costs from postponing 2020 that they would have had to pick up pick up on with no tourism uh, and no additional revenue generated from the contest because from their perspective it's there to make money 
from our perspective, it's there to be a fan, fun, fun show, with lots of great music, lots of party, etc. But they see it very differently. And so I think looking forward, you certainly can't avoid the fact that the insurance premiums on events will be far higher. There'll be less people taking risk. There'll be less people making plans that far ahead. Um, and so I would be very surprised, Elliot, if we get a conclusion on this before the turn of next year, but uh, before the turn of this year into next year. And yeah, it's a very unsure time, like, especially with like, except, you know, 10,000 people, is it, you know, is it safe, you know, for that at the minute? At the minute, obviously not, but in a year's time, you know, they said it's it's hard to predict because as they said, you know, Dance Mini Grand Prix was like seven weeks ago and that was the first major thing to be hit by what's been going on. And now like the entire world's like put, been put on hold and it's just, it's, it's impossible to predict and that's the scary thing. I admire the EBU and the Dutch broadcaster like pushing forward and saying there is a plan in action, but I also think they should have come out and said there is a backup just in case. And I agree with Nicholas, maybe they should just have a TV studio and only the artists go out there because that way it's I something think... that can be controlled and safer. I, mm. I don't know. <laughs> I think what, what we might see is that if Junior Eurovision does go ahead, I think that will give us a bit of an idea of how a possible plan B could be. Because I think with Junior Eurovision always being the little brother that tends to be like a place where the EBU can kind of experiment, I could imagine them trying to maybe do that show in a smaller arena or maybe do that show where it's, it's you know, linked up with satellites of the individual countries where they perform like they talked about could be a plan B this year. If we're going to see a Junior Eurovision go ahead, I think that might be where we see a possibility of how they could host Eurovision next year. I mean, yeah, like I said, online voting, you know, that's been their like little trial thing for three <laughs> years. It doesn't work. It should go away, but they're not going to let it drop. I still think it's going to come into Eurovision, even though it shouldn't, because it doesn't work at all. <laughs> a Junior. It doesn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to round this out, any further points on Rotterdam that anyone wants to comment on? Yeah, just just to pick up on Nicholas's point, um, I do understand that the EBU came very, very close to deciding on the, the studio idea of having uh, broadcasters record. Um, but as, uh, as you guys quite rightly put in the last episode of, of Eurovision Soup, that uh, Russia would spend millions on it and North Macedonia would have someone via Skype. I thought that was a brilliant take, Nicholas. Uh, <laughs> quite right as well. And that's exactly what would happen. That's reality. But next year, that reality, if we get, I think if we do get into January time and this, this is not sorted out worldwide, I think we may very well be facing the prospect of another Eurovision in a very different style. I think it will go ahead next year, but it might look very different to what it is as we know it today. Yeah. And if you want to talk about connection issues, let's look at the voting in Vienna 2015. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, imagine that mid-song. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, that will probably happen to the UK and that might be a good thing, to be honest. Oh, they'll just do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> the BBC We're will done. do it Never. on purpose. And then like the only place where it's shown is on BBC because they always do their own thing anyways. Oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> on the iPlayer. Yeah. I don't. I'm still mad. I'm still mad at the BBC for what they've done this week. I'm still mad. Anyway, second point for this day is that revamps in your origin. Now, obviously, they happen every year and obviously you take a song, you change it, you make it better or worse in some aspects. But I want to know is the bulk of the songs that have been revamped this year, there's eight slash nine, which is Albania, Germany, the Czech Republic, France, Slovenia, Israel, Croatia, Italy, and Ukraine have all been tweaked in some format. Um, should they be allowed to be changed after a national final? Because obviously, and my point is, I think no, because you vote, the public has voted on this song. I don't think it's wrong to take that and then change it. <laughs> Unless like you put out a disclaimer saying you hold the right to change your song or edit your song. But sometimes you know, revamps don't come out better. Like, for example, I voted for Suri in 2018. I wasn't a big fan of the revamp. Would I have voted for it if she went with that final version in February in the national final? I don't think so. Um, Lana, as someone who hasn't changed, touched their song this year, <laughs> Samantha T just kept it as it was. Um, do you think um, revamps should be allowed? Do you think artists should be allowed to tweak and change their songs after being selected? I personally think that they should be allowed but at the same time we do have to consider that it's quite unfair to the other competitors at the national finals themselves because for example if 
a song is revamped, we don't know if the like if the revamped version participated in the national final, would it have still won? Would the results be the same? And I feel like a, we should think about the fact that maybe the other competitors of the national finals are losing their opportunity to represent their country, because maybe in in the case in case the revamp participated in the national final, they would have won. So like. Hmm. Good, so what's your point? Is because obviously when a song is getting revamped, they kind of take take their fate in their own hands. Because it can improve or make it worse. <laughs> um, some have improved this year, some haven't. Um, what what you, what's your viewpoint? Like, should you be allowed to change your song after you've won a national final? Well, I think revamps should be okay, but at least they are not uh, scratching their song and choosing a whole new song. Yes, I'm talking about you, Malta. Mm. Uh, <laughs> 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 or Albania. <laughs> yeah, or Albania. Um, I think, why not? Uh, and I'm very, I'm a very laid back person, so I think that's why. I'm like, why not? Um, I think that um, if, it, if it makes a song better, it's better for me, because if it's better, it's better. So I might be a bit selfish too, but yeah, why not? Swedes, selfish, never. Just completely overpopular in Europe. I've never heard of that. I was saying, Malta changed her song to a Swedish song and had Molly Patterson Hammer go this time for them. So what are you complaining about? <laughs> <laughs> they took a Swedish song and a Swedish singer from Belfast that year. <laughs> you did the big note for Era because you couldn't. <laughs> Nicholas, where do you stand on this? Yeah, so coming from a country that never does revamps, at least I can't remember a single time really done, except for, of course, the times where we used to translate them, uh, our songs into English. Some some of those were good, some of those I feel like harmed the song because the translation was shite. But yeah, I think I think revamps, revamps are completely fine. What I don't like is those like huge revamps. I think minor little tweaks, because you've chosen the song. Now you want to make sure that the song is the best you can possibly send. And I think it's okay to make little tweaks to the instrumental. Sometimes songs that are sent into national finals can sometimes sound like demo versions anyway. So I get that. But I think the, the best example I have of, of a revamp gone wrong, in my opinion, was if anyone remember back to 2016 to uh, Israel, oh. they did... Uh, they had a very different version of Made of Stars win their national final. And then because of the fan backlash, they were like, oh, we gotta change. And I feel like doing a revamp because some people on Twitter have told you to do it is the worst kind of revamp you can possibly do because then you are appealing to this little group of like extreme Eurovision fans that may not even vote for you anyway because they are still stuck in the mindset of oh well the first version was crap so I'm not going to vote for this still. I think you need to be extremely careful when it comes to revamps but at the end of the day I think revamps are okay if they can, if they can just slightly improve on the song. I think you're the only other person I know that preferred Hobie's original arrangement of Made of Stars. Oh, I love the I original version. I thought it's it was great. really good as well. Yeah. Like a sort of like really rocky up tempo song. And yeah, mm -hmm. they changed it into a ballad, which suited Hobie better, as he admitted. But then again, it's like, it's so different now. And like you said, yeah. I, I, would, would the ballad version have done better or worse than what it got? I mean, I, mean, I don't know the original would have done better because it was so polar polarizing, but mm. it was fun. I, I really liked it. They still listened to it. Just going on that, like, Backlash, Stuart, another nation who horrifically changed their revamp because of the backlash was Czech Republic. Now, Benny, he had a song, he changed, he then put, he then doubled down, he then changed again. I think that was four different versions oh, by the end of it. Oh, poor guy. <laughs> should, should you, A, be allowed to change your song, and B, should you really listen to public reception like, like this? <laughs> um, well, firstly, I think you should 
be allowed to change your song. Um, there's a hell of a longer time between February and May, and and songs get boring. People get fed up with hearing the same uh, the same song. So it's quite clever marketing to adjust the type of song. It's sometimes the tempo, sometimes a bit of the melody, and sometimes the words. Um, and or if you're Malta 2016, as Gustav to mention, everything because it was a crap song. So she thought she'd said something totally different. <laughs> That I think I do have an issue, with, but that's another that's another story. Um, if we look over the years uh, and some of the songs which have changed, think back as far as two thousand and three, the Sertab Arena for uh, for Turkey. That was almost almost a ballad when it first started. It was kind of up tempo to a certain degree, but really kind of mediocre. And then the beat hit, and all of a sudden it was a potential winner. And I remember going to watch it, thinking. Yeah, this could win. And of course it did win. It wasn't the greatest vocals on the night, but she sold it. Uh, Marianne uh, in 2003 with Latvia. I think that was very different during uh, during the early stages. Might, I'm not sure. I can't remember whether it was a uh, an internal selection or whether she won a national final, but it was definitely very different by the time it got to Eurovision. Um, and even Yoki Papai last year, um, where he kind of had that Western feel going to it. Uh, with uh, the kind of Clint Eastwood whistling and then they removed it and they changed the song altogether and for me it lost something really quite special. Czech Republic is an example this year of uh, a singer being slightly unsure of himself um, and listening to the critics and the worst thing you should ever do whether you're an artist of any in any way shape or form is listen to what people think because you need to find your own way and his song is actually rather good. It has its own fans. Not everyone likes it, but the ones that do were very disappointed that he changed it. And, and I think he made a mistake there. Hopefully he'll get a chance to, to uh, rectify it next year. By the way, Blue did all right in 2011 when they changed this song for the UK. Came pretty close-ish for us. Ish, if you don't look at the jury score. <laughs> Tell you that, right? Yeah, like 22nd in the jury, because Lee Ryan couldn't sing. I said it. Yeah, that I know was awful. No, I'd still think like the worst revamp of all time, and I don't think this will ever change. Just as is twenty sixteen for Albania, like way to just take a song mm. and just, for lack of a better word, castrate it. Like all the power went. Like, and she's a, she's a rock singer. She's a rock powerful singer, and oh, it was such a dirge by the time it got to the stage. It was so dull, but it still beat Lighthouse Name, which I found very funny. Denmark, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's that's totally fair. Like that song was literally white bread. That's all it was. <laughs> but I just I actually like while while Stuart was talking, I thought of another great example of a revamp done right. Who remembers the original version of uh, of that TikTok song from 2014 Ukraine? Like that wasn't a song to begin with, and it ended up being being like one of the one of the greater entries from Ukraine. So I think that's an example of sometimes. Sometimes the public is wrong, and sometimes the public choose something that's completely shite, and you have to work with it. And I think in that in that situation, it's okay to do a re-aim, because obviously, obviously the broadcasters want to do the best they can. And I feel like if a broadcaster can't even get behind a song, like, what's the point? It's never going to do well, so at least... At least with a revamp, maybe they can get slightly more behind it. I mean, look at the BBC. They haven't been, been behind a single single entry since like the, since like 2000 or something. So look how you're doing. Well, yeah. we got lucky with Blue. Mm. Yeah, for um, it. <laughs> but it's funny, you know, because you choose an internal artist and, and they should have a, a Eurovision-ready song, right? But uh, even with that as an example, um, Blue, a great example, they still changed it. So who knows? But I think you're right. I think you've got to make sure you get behind it. But I do think also there is a time lapse between February and May, which makes a big difference, especially mm. when you're trying to sell a song. Yeah, I mean, I think Blue used a lot A lot of the BBC and Blue's power was, we're Blue, we are very well known over Europe and the world. Like, I still remember that footage of Lena, you being a huge fan of them, you know, in the arena in Dusseldorf, you know, as the reigning champion. I mean, so that, some revamps do work. I remember Lucy Jones changing her song and that worked. But then again, that's because her man, man, management team took over and she's a West End performer and it made it a very West End performance sort of song. And for me, it gave it a bit of a pulse because I remember being quite bored in the national final watching that. As beautiful as it was, I was a bit bored watching it in the Hammersmith Apollo. I was out there like, is it done yet? She just kind of like stood there in a dress. Yeah. Uh, any final points, revamps? Do you think any from this year were good or bad like did any revamp stand out for you did any sort of fail 
my example is Solove. I I love that song, but I do think they made it maybe a bit too busy in the revamp. There's a lot going on now with it. Still love it, but I think it's a bit busy. Uh, does anyone else have any? Oh, actually, no. I know Stuart was just going to like love Armenia because he loves Armenia. <laughs> they completely changed their song. So may as well just tick that one. <laughs> well, just think... that rolled me out to say anything, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I mean, you I'll still just, can. You still can. <laughs> I'll just say one thing, right? If your revamp is only changing a song from your national language to English, then don't do it. Like, that's the only revamp that I will not allow. If that's the only thing you're changing, there's just no reason. There, Don't think you can do better just by changing your song to English. It, that, it doesn't work like that anymore. And we've seen so many examples that that doesn't work. Yeah, I'm look at 8 hertz. Yeah, I, absolutely. No, you're right. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. That was a weird choice, wasn't it? it just really weird work. choice. I've got a question for Lana, actually, um, in terms of uh, Samantha Tina. Ooh, so okay. what would you have done with that song? Would you have uh, would you have kept it? Would you have changed it or scrapped it? That song is awful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I mean... When I was like at Supernova listening to it, it sounded like screaming. I'm sorry. It's just, it's too much. My ears hurt. And really, I would have just chosen a different song for Eurovision. Sadly, that wasn't possible. But it's just at the very bottom of my top. And that's on nationalism. I mean, I hate it. But didn't that song only win because like the online vote helped it win? Because I yeah. I think I remember that it wasn't first for like the Latvian public. No, no it wasn't. Uh, Katrina Dimanta was the first one, and I I voted for her too. She was my favorite. But like on Twitter, everyone the day before were spamming vote for Samantha Tina and she would I don't think she would have done well at Eurovision to be honest she was just she was something different from what from the other songs we had in Supernova but I don't think that's Eurovision material to be honest so, line was yeah. also different and look what happened to that I love that song but but still <laughs> I thought line was gonna do rather well actually mm. so did I I was quite stunned when I thought it came dead last. <laughs> I didn't have to process that, to be honest. I was like, but it's brilliant. And it closed the semi-final. Yeah. <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> no, Samantha Tina, uh, there was so much promise for that song that then like the, the chorus came in and it literally felt like her Aminata fell on the mixing board and it just, they couldn't be asked to trim it down. It was can, just, can, it was. Can I just say one thing about Samantha Tina, which I just want to get off my chest. It's been, it's been, it's been bugging me for such a long time. She at least wins the hair of of Eurovision 2020. I've never seen hair that straight. It, is it a wig? I don't really know. Tamara, Tamara Tedesca's hair, she literally copied it. <laughs> no, it's better. I always, I mixed up Alexandra Rattan, Samantha Tina and Tamara Tedesca. They are literally the same person. <laughs> <laughs> now imagine that power trio. That would be something. Oh God. No, I think I'm with Lana. I would have actually had the runner up heartbeats go for Eurovision mm. for that bit just because it was mad, but I loved it. And also, she sang Cake to Bake, which is one of my favorite guilty pleasures of all time. <laughs> uh, that cake to Bake, I got no clue at all. <laughs> and just that, just looked to jump out the nearest window, I can see. <laughs> uh, shall we move on before we lose ourselves into yes, a wormhole crazy? <laughs> right. Now, this is something that we kind of like touched on last time, so I want to delve a bit further. Now, when an artist gets announced, everyone goes to their back catalogue and, you know, if they're known or not, et cetera, et cetera, whether they're an established artist or a newcomer or a talent show reject. And like, I just want to like, does it matter sending an established artist against a newcomer? And I kind of want to use like Duncan Lawrence as an example. Came from The Voice five years ago, didn't do brilliantly. No one had heard of him in the Netherlands. He goes on to win. But when you look at, say, for example, in Sweden, the newcomers are very rarely given a decent shot. I think the only one I think that's done well as a debut and like won it is Flans in recent time. So and he wasn't that... even a new artist. I oh, know. So he saw this song from like when he was ten or something. But Flatten. does it really matter Flatten. being? <laughs> <laughs> Don't remind me. <laughs> does it really matter sending a newcomer or an established artist? Um, Good stuff. Let's have your point on that. Mm, look over there. <laughs> <laughs> look over there. 
Where? I don't. I think it depends on what country you are performing for. Um, because as you said, in Melody Festival, it rarely works. Uh, but I think it, if you are like in, I was going to say San Marino, but that doesn't work. So some <laughs> some other country, I think you have a, an easier shot. Even in San Marino, you just spin a board and whichever person it lands on, you're going. Just like <laughs> no, you just pay the money. I was going to say, not really. Yeah. You just need 25,000 euros and you're in. <laughs> I'm saving up at the moment. Like, you'll see me in five years. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stuart, obviously, this whole talent show reject name is quite a, like, a thing attached to the, the UK fandom. I'm going to say it. Like, every year, someone who comes from the X Factor or The Voice or something and doesn't win gets hold a talent show reject looking for another shot of fame. Does it matter? Because... Personally, I think if you've done that show, even if you haven't won, I think it helps because you know how a TV show works. And for example, Lorene and Mons didn't win their shows, but they still won and won Eurovision. So <laughs> does it matter? Well, I think it's a UK. Uh, every other country seems to send the voice uh, or former X Factor winners or contestants uh, to their national finals and have no issue with it, some of which do rather well. Duncan Lawrence is a great example. Um, it's in the UK when we send or think about sending someone from those type of shows, we all start getting a little bit upset about it, and I have no idea why. For me, it's never about the artist. It's always about the song, song first. And it always has been. It's never going to change. If you send a really great singer with a really bad song you're not going to win eurovision it's that simple you send a great song with someone who's competent enough to perform it hit the right notes and deliver on stage if you get that right if you get that little combo right you're onto a winner and you're certainly guaranteed on that left hand side of that scoreboard on a saturday night at the end of may um yeah <laughs> try telling sala alto that because I still think the song was really good. <laughs> and she's a huge name in Europe and did awful. <laughs> and I'm still mad about it. <laughs> Nicholas, you normally have at least like one or two artists from your local X Factor in your Melody Grand Prix. And they normally like make the top three. So is this like a big thing in Denmark? Like, is, is having a name going into the selection like an advantage? Like how do you see it? Because obviously you also had Sani, otherwise known as Wigfield, a few years ago in your selection, and she did terribly. Um, so that, does it matter? I mm, it, it's really hard to say actually because I haven't really like fully looked into any of that. I think the reason why someone like Ben and Ten did uh, well this year was because they had a, a young following, and if you have a young following, I think in general you can do pretty well. I think you can also turn it around and say that the reason why these artists do well could be because if you're an already established name, there is a bigger chance that songwriters will actually write for you. Because I feel like that's kind of the case here in Denmark, where it's like someone like, for example, the girl who sang, who sang Starlight, Anna Ritzma, I don't even think she went like through the um the like five cheer challenge in x factor she didn't do well in x factor at all but the fact is she was a name that when lisa Kabel had this song she could just like go through all the episodes of x factor and be like okay who do i want to pick who do i think fits this song right so i think that can have something to do with but i i will say one thing and for the first time ever on this show i'm gonna say something nice about uh, rasmussen so brace yourself because here's the <laughs> thing right Rasmussen and my camera is going to go out of focus, but you're just going to have to live with that because that, there we go. See, here's the thing, right? Rasmussen had no previous TV experience. He had never performed on TV before. He was a nobody, absolute nobody who did like cover bands or something, I believe. But he went out there. He sold the song extremely well. He was a great performer. He won over Denmark. He won over Europe, did extremely well at Eurovision, better than anyone had hoped. And that was because he was a good performer. And that's what matters. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how many fans you have on Instagram. At the end of the day, if you can sell a song, people are going to vote for you. And I think that's what so many people are misunderstanding. Because, for example, people have often looked at something like, for example, when, when Spain used Operación Triunfo. And they're like, oh, well, well they, can't, they can't do Eurovision. They aren't established acts. It's like, no, they just don't have the experience they weren't natural performers and that's what hurt them because someone like Aitana who was also on the on Operation Triunfo 
she's she's an amazing performer still doing really well in like the spanish area when it comes to her music after pasión triunfo and she can do that because she was just a naturally great performer at the end of the day that's what matters it's just the fact of if you want to get known by if you want to get seen by a record label these days you kind of have to be like on a program or you know doing covers on youtube because they gotta they gotta find you somewhere so that's probably the main reason why we're seeing so many of those kind of artists <laughs> Yeah. Side note, I love Starlight. I thought that was a really cute song in Anna Set. It is a cute We're... song. Wearing her pajamas with her little ukulele. What's not to love? <laughs> and then we did the then Lisa Cabell did the same song la uh, the year after and it won. So And then this year did human, which is completely different. <laughs> and we don't talk about that anymore on this show. It's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> and Lana, where do you start on this song? Like what's what's your viewpoint? Sometimes it, it means a lot, like if you're an established artist, for example, uh, I love Twitter, I'm a lot there. <laughs> and I think that sometimes songs and artists get underrated just because they don't get enough attention on social media, because whether we want to admit it or not, it kind of like what others think of something sometimes influences like what we think of for a song, for example. And so if an artist is unknown, nobody will be talking about them. Everyone will just ignore the existence of a song, kind of. I mean, a normal viewer, not like a, someone who binges Eurovision every day. And I think that some songs just stay unnoticed and that's what they do, why they do bad, badly at Eurovision. I must admit, I do think social media is a huge part because you see, even like international finals, you see certain names being pushed. And my example here is Francesco Gabbani. Like the second he was announced to be back in San Remo, everyone said, well, there's your winner. Like no one had heard the song, but mm. apparently vice versa was going to win because it's Francesco Gabbani. And I actually liked the song. I actually didn't mind it. But uh, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's weird how the world works. I think it's just because you're a name, you're guaranteed for success. And if you're not, you're not. Because I, I agree with Stuart, it comes down to the song. Anyone can sing a bad song, or anyone can have a bad song, but it doesn't matter. Like, if you've but got actually, a bad song, you're not going to do well. Actually, I'm just thinking, I think we've also had examples where it's the other way around, right? Because sometimes being an established artist can kind of hurt you because you can have that initial boost and everyone will think, oh, you're the winner. I think especially in the Melody Festival, and we're always very quick, you know, in the beginning to be like, okay, this is an established artist. They're in the fourth semifinal they're gonna do it then we hear the song and we always get disappointed and sometimes i feel like a lot of these songs that we get really disappointed by from these established artists sometimes they really aren't that bad it's just because we were expecting the best of the best the eurovision winner from them and i think it can hurt them yeah. sometimes yeah. you're com you're absolutely right absolutely Wow, Nicholas is getting praised by Gustav and is praising Rasmussen. What is going on today? <laughs> it's, a, it's a special <laughs> this, show. This is not a normal show. No. Any final <laughs> points from anyone to round this out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just, up, yeah, I'm just sorry. I've just got another point, actually. It does go the other way. So Russia is a great example of a, a country that's most of the time. You, know, you think back to 2003, they threw in Tattoo, who were massive internationally and uh were guaranteed a top five position before they even arrived at eurovision it had no bearing on whether they could actually sing which we soon learned they couldn't <laughs> they were going to finish in the top five and they finished third for, i mean they could have just one of them didn't even bother turning up you know they, she turned up the, literally the an hour before god she wasn't there for any of the rehearsals and so you know <laughs> It's a great example of uh, of sending your best artist and being guaranteed a good result. Sergey Lazarev, let me do that again. Sergey Lazarev is a huge star internationally now, not just in Russia, internationally. Lana could probably back me back me up on that one because I'm I'm sure he's big all over parts of Europe. You know, it's not big in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so Sergey Lazarev has been to Eurovision twice and, and nearly won twice. Um, Cliff Richard back in the uh, 60s and 70s was a big star um nearly won a couple of times um but the other flip side to that is alcazar alcazar were a really big international name 
Uh, this is a reference for you there, Gustav. Really big internationally, and yet the Swedes just found every reason possible not to send them. And some of the songs could have done rather well at Eurovision. And probably when I, when I look back at some of the years I've been to Melody Festival and personally, or I've watched Melody Festival as a fan, I think back to, think Alcazar probably should have won at least one of their finals and made it to Eurovision. And it's a shame because I think they could have done rather well for Sweden. Who knows? Maybe yeah. we would have had a Eurovision winner. Hmm. I don't think it helps that one of them went for Switzerland, whatever year, that terrible sort of like super group with that dire song. Don't think that helped. <laughs> Can't remember what year it was. All for one. It was 2006. <laughs> and it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> And then Armenia thought, hey, let's copy it in 2015. And it was that, still awful. Yeah, that was, I was going to say, that was also awful. <laughs> Super groups don't work. Stop it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think I have to come down like with Stuart, like the song will win overall. All I want from an artist when it's represented in the UK is don't be a dickhead. That's all I ask. Just be a nice person to the press and to the people that work there. That's all I care about. Because as we've seen, some negative press can really damage you. And the example they use is Waylon. He wasn't exactly the nicest person in Lisbon, and he got a lot of negativity. I don't know how much of that actually hurt him going forward, but I was never a big fan of him. And then to see all that, it was just kind of like, oh, that's a shame. But mm. yeah, all I ask is don't be a dick, please. That's all I ask. <laughs> Which I don't think is much. <laughs> And to round this out, I thought, like, you know, last time we talked about who we thought could win Eurovision, like, in our heart of hearts, like, actually putting our actual head on. And I actually want to ask something this time of what song do you actually think would have done a lot better than people were expecting? You know, going on bookies or fan hype or just expectations. What songs do we actually think, you know what, this actually could have done very, very well. And I'm going to start this and I'm actually going to say Finland. And I actually think looking back would have done a lot better than anyone was giving it credit for because I think that was a very solid song, sung very well. I think the juries would have absolutely loved it. Do I think the Televote would have got behind it as much? No, but there's definitely mass appeal there with the song and the, the performance and the melody of it. And I actually think in the final, he would have been top 10 in the jury, realistically. And I think he still would have done Finland a very, very good job. I mean, he couldn't have done worse than Derude coming last in the semi. So the only way was up for them. But considering no one was really talking about Axel, and I think it's because Erica didn't win, I actually think Finland would have done very well this year. So that's my thing is looking back, I actually think that would have done extremely well. Nicholas. <laughs> well, you you took mine. So <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, I was because I was gonna vote for my for my lookalike from Finland as well, you know. I think I think because I think there is an extremely good point to what, what Lana said earlier about like some songs really get played down by the fandom just because there aren't enough people talking about them. And I feel like Finland is such a great example that because everything in Finland was about was about Chigolina. Everyone was talking about that song and afterwards everyone was talking about how it was robbed. I think, you know, because at some point you got to move on and be like, OK, this is a song we have now. What do we think of it? And sometimes the fandom is really bad at doing that. I think a great example of that last year could be that everyone was was playing down zero gravity because everyone was talking about electric fields. So, so no one was talking about zero gravity and everyone thought this could be the first time Australia isn't qualifying. Obviously it did well because it was just because people were talking about a completely different song. I think Finland could have been the same case here. And then also Kate Miller Heike starts swinging from a pole, which I still love. Like <laughs> it was, it was a beautiful moment. That's one way to change the staging. I'm just going to fly for three minutes. That's fine. Like imagine, imagine <laughs> if that was what they had planned for this year and they would have to throw that out. Imagine how much money that cost, that whole production. Uh -huh. I do know that um, she put it out last night that on the, the night of the final, Montaigne is actually going to reveal and explain what yeah. her staging was. She did say it was along the theme of puppets. So I am very intrigued to see what she had for a plan for that. <laughs> Stuart, wh who, who do you think would have done a lot better than people were anticipating? Well, but I, you already know mine. Um, so I, I, my rule of thumb always has been um, is just to listen to the song with your eyes shut and imagine the staging. If you can imagine the staging, then that's visually what the designers, what the creative teams are thinking. And, and I, I listen to Armenia and I also relish all the hate it gets because I think this is another Cyprus. Cyprus got exactly the same level of hate going into Eurovision. It got to week one and the rehearsal started and everyone went, oh my God, I love Cyprus. Oh, I can't believe how good it is. 
go back and take a look at all the, the stuff mm. online. It's all still there. It's all hidden away in Twitter history. That's exactly what would have happened here, in my opinion. All, all they needed to do was get some great choreography, uh, put her on stage in the right costume with the right backing dancers, and that song would have absolutely banged on stage, let me tell you. Armenia would have done much, much better. I'm going to, I mean, no one can prove me wrong, can they? But I, I believe it would have been at least a top six. We'll let you have it. We'll let you have yeah, it this thank time. Thank you very much. Can't prove me wrong, and I can't prove you wrong yeah. about Finland either. We're in a win-win here, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, you're right. Like, there was, there was no talk about Fuega until she brought literal fire on stage. Like, you know, that's, and then she shot up to become the fan favourite. Do I still like the song? Not massively. I still think it's quite basic. Did she take a boring song and perform the ever loving hell out of it? Yes. Do I, am I now annoyed she did so well because everyone compares every up-tempo song to Fuego? Fuck yes. yes. Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, let it die, guys. It's been two years. <sighs> it's going to happen just next that, year as well, you that, know? Just because every single, just because a pop song goes into an eight-bar count doesn't mean it's Fuego. I'm sick of it. And then Oben will again. A -shirt. <laughs> I will. I will get that printed next year. Yeah. And then Oben can claim, oh, this is Fuego and this and this and this. And he's, <laughs> he, he's really proud because he's set up this trend. Gustav, um, what was yours? <laughs> well, mine was also Finland. <laughs> with all the reasons that you have already said. So what am I supposed to say now? You're going <laughs> to say that the backup. mamas were going to do well. Uh, <laughs> 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 We don't, there's no point stating fact here, Nicholas. So they no, but I feel well. like it is kind of the same with, with Sweden, right? Because because people people were talking about Bulletproof so much that no one really thought about how great of a song Move actually is as well. It, well like, and it is like that's a, well it, uh, unless you're <laughs> unless you're Gustav, of course. <laughs> if you have normal ears, then then Move is a good song. Yeah, okay. I, I guess I might have to agree. Um... <laughs> Wow, well, this really isn't a normal show today. This is not a... No, no. Um, yeah, so I'm going to stick with Finland with all the reasons that you've already said, and now I'm going to be quiet. Can I just jump in and make a quick question, a quick point even about Sweden and MOVE? I mean, I guess the, the question you could ask for MOVE is, uh, could it perform badly? I mean, there is a possibility that Sweden don't qualify with MOVE, because everyone would expect Sweden to be top 10 again, right? Hmm. That, that's my expectation. Yeah. It's a top eight song. And, you know, the big question is, when is Sweden going to send a song that isn't going to qualify again? It's been a long time. And when are they going to send a song that is going to fail in the final? Because, it, again, it's been a long time. I think I can kind of give you the answer. The day that Sweden stops sending jury bait is the day that that yeah. happens. Because yeah. as long as they're going to keep sending songs, they'll get top two in the in the juries. They're always going to qualify. They need something that the juries can't get behind because clearly... The public hasn't been behind Sweden for the past couple of years, and they've still done well because of the Jerry's. So that's what it takes, I think. Yeah. I, I also think because, you know, Melfest is such a polished show and it's all on the polish. And the one that wins is normally the most polished performance. And the Mamas was in that final. And, you know, like I said last time, love, it, love I hate the song. The three women can harmonize very well. And what does oh, Jerry's yes. look for? A mm. decent voice and a decent performance. And that's what the mummers would have given us. And they still would have been top five in the jury final. And everyone would have hated it. But it's like, from a from a you know critical point of view, what can you criticize about that performance, whether you like the song or not? It's three women doing their job, hitting their marks. There's yeah. there's there's not a fault there. <laughs> yeah. And then you have Dotter who kept missing her bloody light. <laughs> like I watched that back and you see the laser and following her because she keeps moving too much. It's like just stand still, love. <laughs> I still don't get that laser. The one that comes in front of her. No idea what that was for. It's been two months. Don't get it. Lana, did you have anything else apart from Finland or are we gonna have a four against one on Stuart? <laughs> well, I was going to talk about Finland, but <laughs> you guys kinda took that. Uh so I just want to mention uh Slovenia. Uh, that song was my 38th before Eurovision song, or before Eurovision home concert. Yeah, but then when I heard it like kind of live, you know, uh, that song moved to my I think 18th or something. Uh, because the woman can sing, the song is powerful, and I can imagine the staging, as Stuart said, and I think it would have been pretty big. 
And I'm glad we aren't seeing that contest because seeing Slovenia qualify would be the worst thing. That was the worst song this year. I don't care. I don't care what anyone says. It's horrible. It was the worst in the selection. It somehow won. I still don't get it. I sat through like two hours of that shit to watch that song win. It wasn't a good evening for me. I'm still salty. <laughs> Are you sure it's not because Lena came second and you love Lena? <laughs> no, no, because I, I was never a fan of... I, I liked her song, but I wasn't really a fan of her before that, honestly. They were like, I could name, like... We all talked about how it wasn't the strongest selection, and I agree with that, but there were still five other songs that I would have I rather picked. How this one, I don't understand it. It's so, it's so middle of the road. We've seen this kind of song at Eurovision five billion times. There's nothing new about it. Try something else. Last year, Slovenia... You know, something new, something fresh. This year, nothing to talk about. I'm done now. I agree with Lana, though. I think uh, I think Slovenia is is one that could really, really work on stage. A bit well, like they probably um, could, but I I still hate it. But like Ser Serbia last year, I thought Serbia were robbed really in their placing. I thought uh, Novena was absolutely stunning on stage. That that choreography, not choreography, but the, the staging with uh, the kind of the wind blowing the leaves around her, I thought was absolutely magical. And yeah. far deserved better than what she got. But yeah, it's, it's a good voice, I, and it's what juries love. And I think that would have, I, I do have to agree, even though I hate the song. It's a flawless performance that the juries will love, regardless of how the song is. Yeah, I, I do think Slovenia would have got top 10 on the jury, but I think the televote, it would have fallen. Because I mm. just, I, like, I can admit her voice is fantastic, Anna Solic, but the, the, the song, I just, I can't just grab onto it. But her voice is incredible. As for Serbia last year, I just think, like I said, running order put between Switzerland and Serb and Italy, she was just thrown to the lambs like fight for yourself, fan. Like she was not going to do well put between two fan favorites like that, and I felt bad for her. On the flip side, and I actually, and think, I think, in, in two thousand seven, yeah, and Anja Nisa was like, yeah, there you go, yeah. good luck, bye, love. Mm. <laughs> I also think Ireland would have done better than people expected. I think that was a great song. Mm. I think it is a great song. I yeah, think Ireland would have done very, very well. Ooh. I know Stuart hates it. But Run I your over that one. one. I actually think, <laughs> I think it's the worst time I've ever heard in Eurovision history ever. Ever oh, and ever on. and ever. Oh, come on. Really? Absolute garbage. But that's just my opinion. But Gemini yeah, is right there. Today. Gemini is right there. Yeah, I still pick Slovenia over Gemini. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. You're yeah, what is wrong with you today, Nicholas? Jesus Christ! Oh, I'm in a great mood. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just tell. keep going? I have a lot. I have a lot of thoughts. We we can keep going all day. Just unpack it, everything. Sure, yeah. why not? Oh, no. Get everything I, I, out there. Like I said, I don't think Leslie Roy would have potentially qualified, but I think she would have been like 11th or 12th. I think she would have been close. Last, it's a not a chance. La last, last. last are, you sure? Sure. are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> yes. No doubt in my mind. I'm Did sorry, I'm alone. Money, I can see you all shaking your head. Look at me in it, absolute disgust. But um, no, no doubt in my mind, she's finishing last. Just like the UK, we're finishing at the bottom two or three again. Unfortunately, it's time <laughs> to change that. Is Elliot Music Taste always wrong? It's time to is Stuart Music Taste always wrong? I'm just going to sing it at you every chance I get now, Stuart. We're, we're, if we're ever together, I'm just going to do the hey, hey, right in your face. <laughs> yeah. Remind me to bring a gun next time, then. <laughs> And there goes the family rating on this show. When were we ever a family show? <laughs> Germany was uh, was another song, I think. Yeah. Uh, if he nails it vocally, could have been fantastic on stage. And actually mm -hmm. could have... I mean, I personally think Russia would have walked away with Eurovision this year. And so I think... I think Germany would have ran them really close. with, Of course, with, uh, with a daddy not far behind. <laughs> I, I still think it was Bulgaria's. Like I still think it was Bulgaria or Switzerland. Oh, I I no. still yeah, think it, it was Bulgaria's here. Like as much as I don't put Borislav Milalov to win because I think he's a bit of an ass. <laughs> like Victoria is a great singer. They would have just they would have just copied the music video because the girl um the stage director of Lorene was doing it and she is known for doing her staging because one of the most talked about stages last year was Malta, which she did as well. So it would have been shot right. Bulgaria would have thrown all the money at it from their sponsor and then realized they couldn't host. <laughs> so it's there. probably for the better. <laughs> probably. <laughs> you don't want Any to break rub an entire country. I mean, you know, it nearly happened to Ireland. It happened yeah, to Greece. And, <laughs> and Ukraine. How are they doing? How's the TV channel in Ukraine doing these days? Any final points on anything we spoke about today just to round this out? Anything else? What's the throw out other, there to the other world? than an apology to the singer from Slovenia? 
<laughs> I mean, if you want to apologize to her live there, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's, I, I, you know, she's one of those artists well would be like, you know, I, I wish for her to come back next year because I do believe that if she sent a better song, she could do very well. I just wish she wouldn't send generic Balkan ballad number 450. Eurovision loves the Balkan ballad, Nicholas. How many have we seen get top three? I mean, they're all awful, but they do well. Like they are the not awful. We don't need what them are you talking about? The Serbian bloke who came second in 2012. I can't remember his name. I hate his music, but he always does well. <laughs> <laughs> Schleicher or whatever the hell his name is. I don't know. I can't say it. I can't speak sort of, like Balkan. <laughs> you can speak Balkan. I can't speak Balkan, no. None of the You know what I mean. You know what I mean. In Elliot's world, Yugoslavia is still together. <laughs> Look, Stuart can't speak any language. He struggles with English. <laughs> <laughs> we should wrap this up now. Yeah, please. This yeah. is the perfect thing to do right now. And on that note, thank you for watching, guys. We'll be back in a few weeks with another show. If there's anything else you want us to talk about in detail, let us know. We will you know, do that for you. And we also keep an eye on the news and see what we think is, you know, we can dissect and pack a little bit more. Uh, but for now, that has been us all. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Check us out this week. We've got a retrovision coming, 1977. We are also going over the best Greek entries in our minds and what we think is the best entry Greece has ever sent to Eurovision. And yeah, that's just what we're going to be doing. We're still going to be working hard for you guys because we love doing this for you. We're for the fans, by the fans. And Thank you very much, Lee. But for now, it's time to say goodbye to my panel. So goodbye, Nicholas. Bye-bye. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Gustav. Bye. And last but not least, big thank you, Lana. It was lovely to have you back as well. Bye. Thank you very much, guys, and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Hello, it's...